Hi, I'm Buddy Brewer. I am a gold certified Chris Irwin trainer and coach, and I'm here today to share with you some concepts and techniques about horse handling from the horse's perspective. Chris Irwin is an internationally renowned Canadian horseman, author, and clinician. So a few years ago, he held a horsemanship clinic using STARS facilities. After observing the clinic, Lynn Petter, executive director at STAR, became interested in how the methods might benefit the programs at STAR. Over the years, Chris and I have held various workshops at STAR, teaching the staff and volunteers how to communicate with horses effectively using appropriate body language and energy. Based on the methods that Chris and I teach, STAR developed a pyramid as a learning tool to apply the theory and concepts to practical, hands-on work with the horses. I'd like to begin by reviewing the pyramid, explaining how each element applies to working with horses based on their psychology. As we look at the pyramid, the first element on the pyramid is talking about energy. Energy is a force that determines everything when you're around the horse. How in the energy that we emote from our bodies and when we emote that energy is very important to how the horse perceives that we are in the moment. Energy or the lack of energy. You can have too much energy. You can have not enough energy, depending on the situation. But awareness of that energy is paramount in how we relate to our horses. One of the best things that we can learn to do when we're around our horses is to control that energy at all times, never putting excess energy into the face, head, and neck of the horse. We will describe that a little as we go. The second element we'd like to look at today is a combination of inverted frame or relaxed frame. Which is it in the moment? An inverted frame is basically there was a push from the horse, if you saw that. I'm going to ask this horse to take a step back, but never pull his head from the bottom. An inverted frame is when the horse's pole, this area here, is higher than the withers, this area here. When a horse is inverted, the head and neck would be up, if this is the head of the horse and this is his tail. The head and neck would be up, his back would be hollowed out, which also pinched his vertebrae in the back, and that creates adrenaline to the brain. So that's not a good state of being for horses at all. This is a chaotic state of being for them. Frame of body equals frame of mind. So we always have to keep that uh, in our present thought process. What is the frame of my horse? That is a direct insight into what the horse's mindset is. Mental emotional wellness, it's a huge thing when we're talking about frame of body, frame of mind. A relaxed frame. A relaxed frame is basically when your horse is head is down. Here again, this is his head. And if his head is down and he's eating grass, that opens the vertebrae or stretches the vertebrae open in the horse's back, spinal column. And that releases endorphins to the brain. If you notice, your horse is never stressed when he's out in this position. So that's a relaxed frame of body. What we have here with this particular horse is a neutral frame of body. The neutral frame of body is where neither endorphins or adrenaline are being released to the brain. So it's basically neutral. There's very little neutral in the lives of most of us, and there's very little neutral in the lives of most horses. It's good that he's standing there in this relaxed state right now in a neutral frame. Notice he licked and chewed just slightly right there, just for a moment. But it is a constant, constant thing for horses to be inverted, creating the adrenaline flow. There's a slight push to the shoulder there, but never a pull back on the rope, asking that horse just to move that one leg back. Always being consciously aware of your frame of body. 
The next phrase we would like to look at, element, is the no-go zone or the bubble space, whichever you would prefer to call that. Teach and I, Chris and I teach that as the no-go zone. Here at STAR, we refer to as the bubble space. So what does that mean exactly? Let's take a look at that. I'm going to reposition my horse here, but notice there's no pull to the rope. Oh, it's a little stretch there. No pull to the rope, but that was a direct push to the hind quarter, asking this horse to square up toward the camera. I'm going to ask just a little more there, but no pull. What we mean by the no-go zone, or bubble space, is a 45-degree line from his foot here in this direction. A 45-degree line coming out from this shoulder here, from shoulder to shoulder. And we take those two lines and we connect them with a kind of a semi-arcing circle two to three foot in front of the nose. That being the case, that's the no-go zone. So basically, that's where the prey animal, he doesn't want impulsive energy into that zone, the head, face, and neck. One of the most, uh, one of the things that people have the biggest problem with, they want to go love on the horse. To love on the horse doesn't mean that you go to the face, head, and neck. So many people go straight into the face, head, and neck, and you see the horse throw his head up and out and away. He's actually telling you at that point, no, I don't appreciate your energy. I do not appreciate you being in here like that. So this no-go zone is very important to the horse's survival based on the prey mentality. We being predatorial people, we talk face to face. More so, horses talk through the body. So, in all aspects of horsemanship, learning to control oneself in the intent of the energy in this no-go zone is awareness. How aware are we? It's a constant status of awareness for the handler. Your horses are the epitome of awareness. Being a prey animal, they're constantly aware of all things in the environment, the wind, maybe the dog that's running around, maybe the deer they see in the field. But they're constantly aware from the time they see you entering the field as well, what your intention might be. So it's not to say that you can't go in that no-go zone or bubble space. You can, but it is all about how you enter into that, how you're there. And we will show you that just a little more later on. Next element, we've got three energies. Those three energies are push, block, and draw. Those three energies basically affect everything, not only in the horse's lives, but ours as well. A blocking energy, if you notice this left hand, it's always been in contact with the lead rope. There's not a loop in the rope. That would be a first element of block, block. That's a blocking energy. The Lead rope is connected to the halter. The halter is across the bridge of the nose, and that's telling the horse that he is secure. If you hold this too tightly, then he has a tendency to need to want to pull back. If you hold it too loosely, like a lot of people think that this is nice for the horse, this is actually to kind of let your horse down in the moment. He doesn't feel the contact of the rope. This is connection. As we picked up the rope into the left hand, that is a connecting block. Say I'm telling the horse that you're okay, you don't need to go forward, you don't need to go back, you can stay right there in my left hand. So that's a block. More so about block, block is all around us here. We have the walls that we're within, which is blocking energy. We have horses go into paddocks, horses go into stalls, horses go into horse trailers. It's all blocking energy. Horses go into a bit when the rider is riding. That is blocking or releasing of the block, whichever in the moment. So pushing energy, what do we mean by pushing energy? Pushing energy is no more than a physical push. As I ask this horse to move, I'm gonna come around to his side here. My right leg will be the intent of push 
And this horse was hind for him. There's the right leg. Here's going to take this stick and slightly touch there. Just to ensure he got the message. So I'm going to disengage this horse by just using impulsive energy from the right leg. Notice that there's never a pull on the rope, but there's connection. There's an open hip. There's a shoulder that's back telling the horse that he can bring his face in. There's a push. Do you see the intent? He sees it. So there's a push. There's only one place where pushing energy never goes to the horse. We're going to discuss that further too, but that is into the face, head, and neck. Pushing energy never goes to the face, head, and neck. Next thing here is draw. What do we mean by draw? If you've ever ridden a horse into a venue, an arena that he's never been in before, you take him in for the first time, he went through the gate. The gate is a draw into the arena. He automatically knows where he went in, so he is drawn to come back out through that gate. Drawing energy is nothing more than an open hip. My left hip is open, closest towards the horse's face. My left shoulder is back. This is pushing energy from my left hip into his shoulder. Don't want to put pushing energy into this horse's face. This is neutral frame of body as I stand here collectively on both feet straight up. It's neither pushing out either hip or shoulder. So you say, how can all this add up? Push, block, and draw are constantly on the mind of the horse. Herding energy. Horses herd one another. Horses push one another. Constantly in the dynamic of the herd. But it's through the body. Horses that push through the face are considered to be bullies by the herd. And if you're a bully in the herd, you're not truly trusted. You're not, you may be respected, but you're not truly trusted. As we handle our horses at these facilities, we need to understand that trust and respect is earned, never assumed. We can have the best of intention for these horses, but at the same time, sometimes we exploit them. That exploitation sometimes comes from lack of knowledge and understanding. One of the biggest problematic things we have with horses in our facilities is inadvertent pushing energy to the face, head, and neck creates, creates bad behavior, creates burnout for horses, and it causes multiple, multiple problems. If we look at the board just for a moment, we have several things on this next element. We have the mouth, the shoulder, the girth, the flank, and the hip. Those are the five buttons that a horse innately works through. Those five buttons. We're going to start. I'm going to move this horse around for you to where you can see those buttons exclusively on the horse's body. We've already used the button of the hip to push the horse around, so we're going to use that button again here. There's no physical contact here. Look at the horse look. He sees the stick as an extension of my right arm of energy. He just wanted to check that out, so I'm going to ask him to move his body to where he'll be parallel. As I bring myself around, slight block to the face right there, you notice the horse is really standing kind of different in the back end. I'm going to ask him slightly through this button here to back up and change his stance. When you create alignment for horses, just like we just did, it makes those horses feel better about you being there. It lets them know that you're aware. So, the button from back to front, the button of the hip, here, to disengage the hind quarter. We've already shown you how to disengage the hind quarter by getting the horse to step under. We have another button. The next button is the flank button, which is here. The flank button is to ask your horse to go forward. A lot of 
lot of times as a rider, you'll take your legs and go slide in the back from the seat. The one button that is the most important button in the horse's entire body is the girth button. Right where your saddle girth comes down here. So that particular button is a bending button. What do I mean by bending button? It is the button of what the horse feels his most important button. It is where he actually hinges his body through the girth button. So I'm going to demonstrate this slightly. I'm going to ask, this horse's name is Ferris, by the way. And we're going to ask Ferris to bring his head, not by pulling of the rope, but ask him to bring his head and neck toward my right hip, open hip here. By going to the girth button, just touching Ferris, and just to see what happens there. So Ferris has felt like he needed to move. A lot of times that is showing that a horse doesn't bend well. There he comes. He wanted to move his body to bring me his face instead of just bringing me the face. So we'll check this other side. I'm going to ask Ferris again from the girth button just to bring his head and neck slightly to the left. Notice there's no pull, but there is connection on the rope. There, he just straightened. He just straightened. A horse has to trust you to bring you the head in this manner. He has to trust you. Ferris does not know me, and I do not know Ferris. So there's a building relationship going on here. So there's a little bit more to the left, as you notice. And all I'm doing, I can take my right hand and ask him here. Just a little pushing. That's your inside left spur. Might for left turn if you're riding. If you notice, Ferris is not really resisting. He's listening, he's paying attention. And all we're asking Ferris to do is just bend his head and neck more so to the left. This is a typical behavior from a horse in this type of facility because they do not want to give up that head and neck. If you think about this, why would they not? The mountain lion comes to kill the horse through the face, through the head and neck. And so in Ferris's situation right now, he doesn't fully trust. There's a little bit, there it is. There it is, good boy. So congratulate him here by petting the withers. So that girth button, horses innately work each other through that as well. One more little test for Ferris. a little bit of stretch and relaxation to the top line there as we work this button on the horse. He needs to move so I stop the touch. And I open my right hip and I come back and I stay out of that no-go There's a side release from Ferris. I'm not asking. So, we have so far for each you, we have the button at the hip, the button at the flank, the button at the girth, and then we have two buttons at the shoulder. We have a button on the side of the shoulder here, we have a button on the front of the shoulder here. Those two buttons on the shoulder can be used in different ways. This button here is to ask this left front leg to lift and back up. If you're using the button from the side of the shoulder, either shoulder, it would be to move over. Right now, he's not set up diagonally. And what I mean by that, his right foot is back, his left foot is forward. So to ask him to move his right shoulder over would be inappropriate, actually. So we're going to go back to the opposite side. So this particular button is to ask him to move that shoulder over. So let's just put a little push there. There we go. That's how you move the shoulders, of course. You don't pull their head to the side, to the left or the right. There we invite the head to come back and look where he goes, directly to the open hip. That's gratitude. What we're doing here, 
is horse language. We're working through the buttons of a horse that they innately know and that they also work through each other constantly. Now watch Fair straighten and then we're going to move on. We're going to use that button to straighten right there. If you'll notice throughout this segment, my core energy is a huge thing. Going back to energy just for a moment, my core energy is now looking directly at the camera. My left hip is open toward the horse's body. My left shoulder is back. There's connectivity through the lead rope. The horse is totally aware of each of these things, constantly. So, we have these buttons. We have one more left, right? Which is the mouth. Right here, where the lips come together, is the fifth and final button. The three energies of push, block, and draw, you never put push into this button. You can block or you can draw, but you never push into the face. When, when people are pushing horses' faces away from them, normally what's going on, I refer to that a lot as bickering siblings. People will be in this area, into the no-go zone. The horse bumps his head into them. They push the horse back with the left hand if they're on this side. Or they pull the horse's face over. None of that is necessary. If you stay back away from the horse's face, head, and neck, then the horse will be a lot calmer, a lot quieter. But we never put impulsive energy into that face, head, and neck, and at the corner of the mouth. We can block the corner of the mouth. If I'm standing in a respectful manner to the horse, there you just got a little lower with his head, a little more level headed. If I stand in a respectful manner to the horse and the horse brings his head around to push into me, then I can put up a block. If you think back, this is a moving block. This block can go up, this block can go down, but this never progressively pushes into the face. That's foolish behavior. So, that is the last button, the button of the mouth. Horses know these innately. This is the language of horse. We need to learn these things. You notice this contact never wavers through the rope. It's always there, letting that horse know that we're there for them. Now that we're outside in Star's Outside Arena, we're going to take a look at the last line of the training pyramid. It encompasses five things. Alignment, forward, contact, boundaries, and timing. So I'll try to explain those as we go. The goal for today's demonstration is to improve our equine knowledge, communication skills based on the horse's psychology, and to create a working environment that is both safe and effective. Safety is a huge thing. Um, and first and foremost, in all aspects of horsemanship, should be safety. Safety is of the utmost importance for your clientele, your students, your staff, and also our horses. But it's your clients first. And the only way we have safe clients is the fact that we have safe horses. With the assistance of Stephanie Studer, equine manager here at STAR, also a certified Chris Irwin trainer, and Abby Phelps to her left, is a volunteer horse leader here at STAR. They're gonna be helping me in this next segment. Um, we're gonna to try to demonstrate a horse that is being led properly. We're gonna show you proper and improper way to lead the horse as well. And we're gonna show you a horse being with a mounted by a rider through this section also. So let's get started and we're gonna look at these last elements on the pyramid. This is, Steph this is Stephanie to my exact left, and this is Abby to her left. We want to thank them for being here today. So Stephanie, would you take the horse, please? So alignment. I'm going to stay close to Stephanie here for a moment. So we're going to talk about alignment just briefly. Um, alignment to be able to lead the horse forward. If we take a straight line on the ground from the horse's center, that's his spinal column, is horizontal to the ground. And we're going to say this is his intent of energy, straight toward the camera. Stephanie's center are basically 
a projection from her belly button, her center, would be two parallel lines coming, being together. These lines should never cross. What do I mean by that? If Stephanie gets ready to make a left turn, Stephanie should not be looking and have her center to the right to impede upon the horse's forward progress. So as we look at this, we're going to ask Stephanie to ask this horse to go. There's two ways to ask a horse to go. One is impulsive or herding energy to the flank. Another is drawing energy. Most of the time with horses that are quiet and soft and very passive, drawing energy can be a good way to go. Horses that are a little more stoic, need a little bit more push because they have their own fortitude about them, you might need to push. I asked Stephanie so. to take this horse for a walk, and as Stephanie takes this horse in hand to lead forward, she has contact on the right hand, she has boundaries in the halter, she has alignment in her body, in the horse's body, the elements of timing and the elements of the balance that she can create through the horse's body, we'll see as she moves forward. So we've got alignment, forward, contact, boundaries, and timing are the elements that designate how the horse goes and where he goes. So we're going to ask Stephanie to do the proper thing here and to take this horse toward the camera and then go to the left. So as Stephanie stepped off on the left leg, the outside leg, which opened her inside right hip, and the horse did not come forward from the draw, so she was able to go back to the flank by reaching around her back with the stick just slightly and saying, come forward, just with a touch. The proper diagonal, as Stephanie moves this horse in a circle, is when the horse steps on his outside right leg is when Stephanie can actually ask the horse to go to the left. And I'm going to demonstrate that for you very quickly. What do I mean by that? There's a diagonal in everything. There's a diagonal in everything we do in the way that we move. There's a diagonal in the way the horse moves. If this is the horse's right front leg, here, the horse is hopefully going to the left here, that step would be he takes the left leg to the left. If I ask this horse to turn to the left when he's on the left leg, look what happens to the body. Impulsive energy coming from back to front from the hind quarter through the spinal column is impeded and the horse is thrown off balance, sending shock waves through the spinal column and the horse blames you for that as a horse leader. So, intuitively, awareness of diagonal and or the lack of can constantly be a problem for us as horse leaders. All right, so we're going to ask Stephanie to do this wrong now. As Stephanie is going to ask this horse to go in a typical manner, I'm going to ask Stephanie to lose the stick for the moment. I'm going to ask Stephanie to go up at the horse's face where most people are. Stand up at the horse's face, please. Yeah, and you see that horse already begin to say, hey, he's looking out to the right. So there. Do you notice that right there? As Stephanie pulled on the rope, the horse inverted, hollowed his back, got a shot of adrenaline, which creates resentment in a lot of horses and creates a lot of these bad behaviors that we experience. As we experience those bad behaviors, over time, even the most passive horse begins to become combative. They might bite, they might nip, they might use their left shoulder in, St in Stephanie's position there and push into you. They might take their face and push into you. We blame the horses for that. Most of the time it is not our fault. It is not with malicious intent that we do these things. It's basically lack of horse skills and awareness. So as we ask our horses to be led forward, we're gonna try this one more time and we're gonna do it correctly without the stick. Granted, if you step off with the left foot and you hesitate waiting on the horse to come to the open draw and he doesn't, you can reach around with the rope to touch the flank to put impulsive energy forward. There we go. Good.
that is a kind horse being led in a passive manner. Now, Stephanie's kind of crowding the face, head, and neck here. As she crowds that face, head, and neck, notice the horse leaning his head over to the right, the outside. As she stays back at the shoulder, the horse is much more content, level-headed, and quiet, going into the contact of the right hand. There's a little bump in between the two. Okay. You know, when I teach privately, I constantly teach people all the time, and here as well, that 100% of the time I want the horses to yield to my space so they don't step on me. Okay. So that's a little insight of look at being able to lead a horse properly, taking into account the entire pyramid, controlling your energy, knowing the frames, understanding the bubble space, knowing the three energies of push, block, and draw, knowing the five buttons on the body to push and when to push them with diagonal timing, and also the five parts of the element at the last there that actually is alignment, forward, contact, and boundary, sets up not only where they go, but how they go, which is the most important. With a relaxed frame, relaxed mind, forward into good hands. So now we're gonna take a look at the mounting block. We are here at STARS facility where they do a lot of mounting, the, the various riders, they even have a chairlift on this particular mounting block if need be. But Stephanie's going to bring this horse in, and I want to kind of set the stage for you. She's going to be in that no-go zone. She's going to be in that horse's face and in his space as she approaches the block. We'll see the horse's reaction. Maybe we'll get a negative reaction and maybe not. Not all horses give us that negative reaction, but that still does not mean that they appreciate the fact that you're in my space and I don't like it. It's no different than me crowding. If you look at me crowding Abby right here for a moment, I'm in her personal space, okay? So this is not comfortable. Here comes Stephanie. She'll be coming in, and this is a different horse. So come on in, Stephanie. Stephanie's our equine manager here at STAR, which teaches these techniques on a normal basis. She's in that no-go zone, and she's trying to block the horse with the body here. And you see the horse push and surge through her. And now she's standing directly in front of the horse. This is a habit that a lot of people have. You do not want to do that. You can get, the horse can bite you at that point. The horse can block you, push you out of the way with his face, head, and neck. He could actually run over you if need be. So we're creating bad behavior in the horse by standing this close to the horse on a constant basis. So we're gonna ask Stephanie to show you how to approach the mounting block be respectful of the no-go zone and be respectful of the horse to where the horse doesn't have the tendency to act up, get resentment, and not want to stand at the block. So, Stephanie, would you go out and come in appropriately, please? As Stephanie leaves, she's going to go into the hallway, make a turn. She will be coming in on the left side of the horse because most of the leading is from the left side, even coming up to the block. She'll be here, her horse will be in the right hand. She will go in front of the horse here. She will change over, let the horse come through, and she will be at the horse's shoulder when she asks for the halt. There. Notice her impulsive core energy was pushed into that horse's shoulder. Now the horse is in her right hand. She's actually taking her left hand and touching the shoulder button on the front, asking the horse to back. But there was no intention to the rope, no pulling of the head and neck. So therefore there was no inversion and there was no resistance in the horse's body. So much of the time we're putting so much resistance in horses before we get started. Now we're gonna ask Abby, our volunteer and also a horse leader here at STAR to mount this horse appropriately. As she prepares for that, if you watch Abby as she mounts, she doesn't just plop down on the horse's back to hollow the horse out before they get started or put shock waves to the spinal column. And I know this is not always possible in certain situations with certain clientele, but she will mount and she will control her weight as she sets into the saddle, not plopping down into the saddle. 
Okay, so we're back in the arena now with a different horse and a mounted rider. We have Stephanie as our leader again and Abby as our rider. And we have Dan as our horse here from Star. So what Stephanie's going to do is show you that same sequence of events that happened without a rider, now with a rider. We're going to keep the aspects of alignment. We talked about the center lines. Alignment into forward, into her right hand with contact and then the boundaries of her body, the boundary of the fence, the boundary of the lead rope, and then the timing of the diagonal as she moves forward. These elements all go into play here again, not only where they go, but how they go, most importantly. And then after we show you this left-hand turn, we're gonna take you into a right-hand turn with Stephanie being on the left side, so watch this closely. The proper thing for Stephanie to do, and I'll set that up as she comes toward us in just a moment. Okay, so Stephanie, are you ready? Yep. Abby, you good? Ready. ready? Okay, so ladies, when you're ready. So that was good. Stephanie stepped off with her outside left leg. If the horse were to do this exactly right, he would step off with his outside right leg for me to go. Stephanie is going to put a kind of a half halt here when the horse is on the outside diagonal right to set him up for left turn. He was actually looking out to the outside there slightly. So a little more inflection from the lead rope to the girth to create left bend. There's more left bend there. There's fluid timing coming through the curve. Good. Now Stephanie is going to make an offhand turn to the right. She's going to be coming forward, bending the horse with her right hand under the neck, putting her finger up toward the corner of the mouth where that last button is, there's a complete circle in an offhand turn with a relaxed horse with a head down, and then we'll be coming to a halt. There you go. And you know, one thing I want to point out to you, that was very nice, Stephanie, Abby, very good job. The aspect of when your instructor tells you to do something as a horse handler, a horse leader, doesn't mean that you have to do it abruptly in that split second. Transition, give the horse time to be able to think about, discern what it is that you're trying to get across to them. Don't expect because you took it in as a leader that your horse got it as the instructor said it. Give the horse time to think about it and create that in your own body to transfer that to the horse to make those changes. We'll now go forward, and as we go forward this time, we're going to take a look at the trot. As we look at the trot, one of the biggest problems we have with the trot is people, they're walking their horse forward, they're walking their horse forward, and then the instructor says trot, and my leaders come up, and they pull right there on the horse. As they pull on the horse, you notice how inverted the horse got? This is a very passive horse. This goes back to that aspect of kind of, of, kind of um, exploiting the horse, for lack of a better word. It kind of exploits our horse, creates these bad behaviors. Part of the reason why we're here at STAR, so many horses take this point, so many horses come in very passive. They may not have anywhere else to go. It may be later in their lives. They can have various medical situations, but they're still useful. But if we exploit them in a mental and emotional status, they become a little bit resentful. That creates those bad behaviors. We've said that in the past. We'll say it again. Creating those bad behaviors and then the horses are out of the program. As they're out of the program, we're looking for more recruits. That was basically the main reason that I came to Star when Lynn first approached me, was how do I stop my horses from burning out? Here again, pressure to the face is one of the main contributors. Okay, so Stephanie is going to move off to her left, and as she gets to this final curve down here in this small dressage arena, she's gonna ask this horse to move up to a trot. As she does that, she's not going to pull the horse's face forward. She's going to increase her energy, open her chest, stay at the shoulder, and ask this horse to move forward. Now let's see how this works. So Stephanie, when you're ready, go to the trot, please. There you go. You notice Stephanie's body position. That was very nice, ladies. Very nice. There, a little block to the left side of the face and transitioning back down to the walk. And we're gonna take that up one more time. Stephanie, this time I would like for you to do it wrong, okay? Give that horse time to calm down a little bit and then do what most, what you teach against all the time here at STAR. Do what you see most people do. 
Okay. So Stephanie's a little ahead of the horse. Go ahead and be ahead of the horse, Stephanie, a little bit. Okay. But stay back at the shoulder is the point I'm trying to make. Stay back at the shoulder. Transition to the trot. Transition to the walk. Don't abruptly shut the horse down. Don't crowd the horse at any one given time. Crowding the shoulder is what gets you bumped out of the way. Horses bump you because you're too close to them. One of the biggest things I like to see is that horse yielding to its outside right as you're turning left. Yielding is a great attribute. Teaching your horse to yield always to the person that's doing the handling. Okay. We're going to ask for a halt now, Stephanie. Transition to the halt, please. Easy. Easy. There. Notice the horse is licking and chewing. The lowering of the head is acceptance. It wasn't done a... It wasn't done abruptly at all, but it was very controlled, very controlled, aware of the energy that Stephanie was putting out and the transfer of energy between handler, rider, and horse is always present. Great job, ladies. In summary today, as you've seen during these demonstrations, learning to read and speak the language of horse fluently is a key to effective communication. Bad behaviors and problems are often the result of miscommunication between humans and horses. Establishing a partnership based on mutual respect and trust requires an understanding of equine psychology and the ability to interpret equine intent through the appropriate use of energy. Unhappy, non-compliant horses are constantly unhappy with us but because the way that we use our energies around them and we can convert those horses over to being focused, confident, content, and willing to do the task here at STAR and your facilities as well. On behalf of myself and STAR, I would like to thank you for your interest and time, attention, and hope you enjoyed today's demonstration. I encourage you to incorporate these techniques into your programs and I am confident your result will be proactive. That's wrong. Sorry. Stop. In summary, as you've seen during the demonstrations, learning to read and speak the language of horse fluently is the key to effective communication. Bad behaviors and problems are often the result of miscommunication between humans and horses. Establishing that partnership based on mutual trust and respect requires an understanding of equine psychology, the ability to interpret equine body language, and the skill to communicate intent through an appropriate use of energy. Unhappy, non-compliant horses can become very focused, confident, content, and willing to work for you. On behalf of myself and STAR, I want to thank you for your interest, your time and attention, and hope you enjoyed today's demonstration. I encourage you to incorporate these techniques into your program. I am confident it will result in more positive outcomes. There may be an upcoming workshop here at STAR in the near future. Contact STAR or visit their website for further details on the upcoming clinics that may be taking place in October and November. I would like to see you here. If you could all come, that would be great, and we can expound upon what we've already learned in this particular session. If we give our horses what they truly need, they will give us what we want. Thank you so much.